Hello and welcome to Technically Speaking, where scientists and engineers come together to chat about a common interest, share knowledge and satisfy some curiosity. I'm Antonia and today I'm joined by Jasmine, Sophie and Alistair to talk about something called e-fuels, an alternative type of fuel to traditional hydrocarbon sources, and also have a think about how we might be fueling our travel in the future. So to start off with, Jasmine, what's your interest in this as a engineer? My background is sustainability as well as chemical engineering, which involves a lot of fuels. So I find it really interesting because aviation sector is like one of the, the most heavily polluting sectors globally. So it accounts for 2.5% of total global greenhouse gas emissions, which is actually more than the UK's total greenhouse gas emissions. So it's like a really important sector to target to meet decarbonisation t- goals. But at the same time, it's a really hard sector to decarbonise, just because the fuel that you use, it's really energy intensive so it's quite difficult to replace and also there's a really high demand for flights and it's growing specifically for like cheaper flights so it's kind of an awkward balance to try to decarbonize because you also want to make flying affordable because people want to fly yeah absolutely lots of uh, competing factors there so over to Sophie, I think you come from a slightly different background. That's right yeah I'm actually a chemist by training but I feel like I'd probably describe myself more as a a generalist um, than perhaps a hardcore chemist. Um, I, but my background is that I did a bit of a stint in the nuclear industry, which came after studying chemistry at Manchester University. Um, but I found that I really wanted to go and do something um, that was a bit more in the startup sphere. So I did a bit of freelance work and also did some work in music festival sustainability, which was really interesting to see sustainability from a slightly different angle. Uh, And then I suppose specifically for this chat, um, my interests are around COP26, which was a large climate change festival that happened in uh, Glasgow in November 2021. And I suppose that's where I got that real passion for wanting to to visibly be a part of the solution to helping solve climate change, um, which is where Carbon Neutral Fuels was born. And now that's a great segue to talk to Alistair. So you're starting a company or you have started a company with Sophie called Carbon Neutral Fuels. So do you want to tell us a bit about your background, how you got there? Yeah, sure. Uh, So my background is I studied uh, computer science at Imperial College um, almost 20 years ago now. And after I graduated, I ended up starting a, a cloud computing company in the IT sector. Uh, And I ran that for 15 years, which was a a nice long run. But I've always had a huge interest in energy, uh, and in particular, nuclear energy as a potential solution for for climate change. And uh, that led me to COP26, where I was campaigning with Sophie on on behalf of the the nuclear uh, world. And I've also had an interest in something called power to liquid e-fuels, which I came across a number of years ago. And Sophie and I had some chats about that. And so in September of last year, we ended up starting Carbon Neutral Fuels. And the plan is to make synthetic low carbon fuels. That's great. So I'm glad to have you here so that we could talk a bit about e-fuels and what it means for industry, particularly if it's for the aviation industry. What I understand of an e-fuel is we've got hydrocarbons that make up most of our usage of fuel around the world 82 percent of our global energy use comes from fossil fuels but if we look at the base chemicals they can come from different sources it's quite interesting so when you look at a hydrocarbon it consists of uh, mostly straight chain uh, carbon and hydrogen atoms and when you burn a hydrocarbon it basically it's an exothermic reaction with oxygen where the carbon uh, reacts to form carbon dioxide and the hydrogen reacts to form water vapour and you get um, energy out, which is why it's useful for us. Um, But you can actually run that process in reverse if if you use the right technology to take water and carbon dioxide and effectively put that energy back in and you can synthesise these long chain hydrocarbons again. So it's kind of like running things in reverse. And that's effectively what a power to liquid e-fuel Uh, is and the technologies that we would usually use to do that would be um, an electrolyzer to split the water into hydrogen 
and um, you'd also need some carbon capture to carbon uh, to capture the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and then you would run the carbon uh, dioxide um, and the hydrogen through a fischer troughs reactor uh, and that will sort of combine those atoms um, together uh, with only water as a, a waste product and those hydrocarbons can can be anything so you you can make uh, jet fuel you can make marine diesel um, it's pretty flexible in the process okay that's that's great explanation um and e-fuel is the same as a power to x or power to fuel or is there a different terminology yeah there's a, a lot of terminology in this field and um the power to x basically describes um quite a few processes so you can do power to methanol for example um and the general idea is you're converting electrical potential energy into chemical stored potential energy. So uh, it's a very energy intensive process because fossil fuels, I suppose, in a way represent uh, nature's endowment of free energy, where over millions of years, sunlight fell on the earth, photosynthesis converted that sunlight into um, uh, sugars, uh, nature capturing the carbon dioxide in this case. And then over millions of years, those sugars broke down into um, uh, hydrocarbons with, without the oxygen, which make a fantastic fuel. And all humans have had to, done, uh, to do is to come along and stick a straw on the ground, and they've got all this free energy. But unfortunately, that free energy is, is causing the, the climate to warm up in the form of all this carbon dioxide that's accumulating in the atmosphere. And so we really need to find an alternative. But if, if we're going to do that, we, we have to put the energy back in and um, and that energy has to be low carbon. So this power to X process really describes taking, as I said, electrical energy and converting it to other forms like methanol or, or hydrocarbons. And Sophie, you had an interesting stat about how much energy that might take. Yeah, that's right. And it's actually quite a shocking statistic, actually. So um, in the UK, all of the jet fuel that we consume is 1.5 billion litres, which is an extortionate amount. And actually, if we were to make all of that um, using a power to liquid process, um, it would actually require 35 gigawatts of electricity, which is even more electricity than we consume as a UK, as the UK population overall, that currently sits at about 30 gigawatts. So when we're thinking about the process of converting the whole aviation industry to sustainable fuels, we're really talking about massive numbers here. It's an interesting challenge because different sectors have specific targets, but the aviation sector has been a bit slow. There have been sp certain airlines that have put targets on how much of their fleet will be powered by sustainable aviation fuels which encompasses both e-fuels but also like bio-derived fuels and other types of alternative to alternative fuels. But recently within the EU, so might impact the UK, may not impact the UK Brexit. Uh, fit, for, <laughs> fit for 55, it's a legislation that kind of just like outlines how the EU member states will meet their decarbonisation sector. And for the aviation sector, there's a target for 2% of jet fuels must be sustainable. So that, so that, but that encompasses like all different types of alternative fuels. So 2% must be sustainable fuels by 2025 and with a target of 70% by 2050. So it's like, it's, it's an interesting area, but it's also like, because of the different governments and policymakers are putting targets, I, I think we're going to see a lot more companies like Sophie's Alistair's um, coming into the picture to help this sector decarbonize. So I think it's quite interesting. So in two years time, we, we need to have 2% sustainable aviation fuel and then suddenly go from 2% to 70% yes. by 2050. Yeah. Exponential growth. Yeah. In the UK, they've um, set a target of 10% by 2030. And uh, that's coming into force um, in 2025. So they have five years, basically. Yeah. Why Why have we got... Well, it, it seems like a lot of change to happen in a short amount of time. Why haven't aviation already switched to sustainable aviation fuel? They have. So, like, British Airways have done some work. The thing is, because currently 
these alternative fuels, they're much they're just more expensive than conventional fuels. And then the added fuel cost and translates into higher airfares, which is obviously not good for your business model if you're an airline. Yeah, absolutely. So the the, the mandates that are coming into force um, are, are going to need some kind of subsidy from the government to bridge that price gap. Um, and to give you an indication, uh, sustainable fuels are t- typically three, three to five times more expensive than conventional jet fuel. And if you're a budget airline, uh, fuel is one of your largest costs. And so we're probably going to see airfares uh, increase in prices, unfortunately, as a result of the climate change legislation. There's also reasons like the fact that up until now, or up until a few decades ago, there wasn't really a need to. Obviously, in terms of climate change, there was a massive need to, but because this legislation didn't exist, it, there wasn't really that social incentive to drive that change. And and also there are there are so many technology developments that happen elsewhere. So things like biofuels. So just specifically in terms of our power to liquid process, a load of other attention has gone to other projects which are very valuable. And it's sort of how do you do that technology leapfrog, um, which is where you, you develop technology and then that propels you onto something else. And I think we're only starting to see that pick up speed now. Yeah, absolutely. And the UK government is uh, doing quite a lot to try and um, spur on the advancement of these sustainable fuels. And they've got something called the Advanced Fuels Fund, where they've been awarding, um, they have a pot of £165 million, uh, which they've been distributing to to, um, sustainable aviation fuel businesses. And that includes, uh, they have a second window of £55 from that £165 million pot. Uh, And they've said that 50% of that they want to earmark for power to liquid projects in particular. Because historically, Jasmine touched on this, um, sustainable fuel can also mean biofuels. um, And the Department for Transport even classifies household waste, like your black bin bags, as a source of potential feedstock for these sustainable fuels, which is a little bit sketchy because you're taking some uh, carbon that that would be sort of buried under the ground and, and you're burning it and releasing it. So it's not truly low carbon, but it's slightly less carbon than fossil fuels. So they're, they're including it. Uh, I'll just add in that um, another reason why aviation sectors have been a bit slow in comparison with other transport sectors is just because... Um, the technology that you would use is different to like other modes of transport. So like with road vehicles, everything's going electric. So, but you can't really have an electric airplane because it just wouldn't work. It's too heavy. It would never lift. It would never take off the ground. Yeah, I heard a fascinating stat that to to fly a battery requires more ba- energy than is in the battery due to the weight. Yeah, yeah. Mm, so I've heard this as a energy payback before for planes, electric batteries just don't pay back. <laughs> no, it's and also because like with batteries, because one of the keys, like something, so the Asian, Asian sector, like they were working on how to like, reduce fuel consumption to reduce their em- emissions because that was just easier than moving into just alternative fuels. Also another reason why Asian sector has been a bit slow. But um, with batteries, your plane would get heavier rather than lighter. So that's a mm. issue because it would also you'd have to just like also change the design of the airplane because um, airplanes when they're stationary, like they do, they will buckle under their own weight just because they are so heavy. So they're meant because they're, they're designed to be in be, be suspended in the air, and if you can't get your plane to lift off, then it's kind of pointless. But yeah, that's a really good point, Jasmine. Actually, because. When you're considering the the whole life cycle of the sustainability of something, you need to consider what you're making your 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 the thing yeah. from. So what yeah. you're making your plane from, right through to what fuel is it using, right through to how are you going to decommission or you know retire that that vessel. Um, so with different e fuels, there are different things that you need to factor in and accommodate for so so with the power to liquid process it's a drop-in replacement for yeah. existing jet yeah. fuel so you don't need to to actually change any of that whereas if you think about other options like electrification <clears throat> like hydrogen there's a whole infrastructure change that's required um which this is for another podcast but the sustainability of that is is an interesting question 
Yeah, the, the cost and the time involved of replacing every plane in the sky with, with a, a, a mythical electric version or, or a potential hi hydrogen version, is it's, it's really challenging. But with um, sustainable fuels, they're drop-in replacement. So yeah. you can literally decarbonize by just switching your fuel supplier. You just phone up BP and say, um, see you later, and then phone up someone like us, and, and hopefully we'll be able to su supply <laughs> with as much fuel as you need. Why power to fuel instead of bio sources then? Or is it just an alternative option? You know, we can't have all of one source, you know, diversify your supply. Yeah, I think we're going to see all of the above. There, there are funding that the UK government through the Department for Transport funding all these different approaches and power to liquids are relatively new. And it's been quite difficult to do it historically because there just wasn't the availability of carbon capture technology to capture that CO2 from the air. But there's now quite a few companies coming through that have technologies that are approaching uh, commercialization levels where you can buy this at a reasonable price and deploy it in a reasonable time frame. And that's kind of what is enabling uh, this whole power to X process. And the other thing that's worth touching on is is the cost of, of the electricity. And um, one of the challenges in, in, in Europe and the UK is that the, there isn't a huge availability of low carbon electricity. And a lot of it is supplied through the electrical grid. And in the UK, uh, the current price is sort of 30 to 40 pounds per kilowatt hour. Whereas if you look at somewhere like Norway, uh, they have incredibly cheap power because of all the hydro and the same is true of Iceland and you can get potentially five pence a kilowatt hour so that's a absolutely huge price difference and the the cost of these power to liquid fuels is driven uh, predominantly by the cost of that electricity so for power to liquids to really take off if you'll excuse the pun in Europe <laughs> they're uh, gonna have to, to deploy, deploy a lot more uh, cheap low carbon uh, electricity and that's actually a reason why Sophie and I are quite um, optimistic about small modular nuclear in the future, which uh, potentially can deliver always on lots of cheap um, electricity. You touch on a, an interesting issue, actually, which is around social mobility and access to travel, access to global travel. And I think there's an interesting perspective from, um, from the industry about who should be paying for the sustainable fuel. And for the, the for the price increase, because um, globalization is is becoming greater, and there's more access to travel for people across the world, which is a fantastic thing. Um, but just as a, a thought exercise, who who should in fact be paying for the sustainability of the fuel that we're using? It doesn't seem fair that if we're going to hike um, uh, ticket prices up massively, that then only the rich have access. To, to global travel so there's sort of a social um, conscience piece that as a as a society I guess we all need to have that conversation and work out where the burden of responsibility falls and it's most likely not going to fall on one particular person or one particular organization or, or part of the supply chain but where should it fall um, and actually the electricity argument is a very strong one because as Alistair says it's massively that massively influences the price of our product um, but if there's opportunity to bring that cost down, then it would be more equitable for a whole host of reasons. That's a really interesting point. I hadn't thought about the sustainability of travel in, in a social context. And these are such big nebulous problems that we're trying to tackle. We're all coming at it from very different perspectives and very different motivations. But fundamentally, we'd like to be a part of the solution to climate change. We'd like to have a world to live on going forwards. We'd like it to be in a fair and just and equal society. And it's just how do we... How do we get there in the most efficient, fair, speedy way possible? One, th one thing that I find really fascinating uh, about power to liquids is that it's a really uh, elegant process, whereas some of the other fuels, like biofuels, um, have a lot of challenges around them. So, for example, traditional biofuels that are made from crops, you're competing with food crops, and that can drive the cost of food up, which isn't necessarily ethical. And there's also um, agricultural uh, wastes and runoff into rivers, etc. So biofuels have a lot of challenges associated with them. I feel like a lot of those challenges were linked more to the first generation of bio fuel sources and that that's being tackled in the second generation third generation which 
not going to go to in this episode because that could be a whole nother episode but just (laughs) you know using poorer quality land that couldn't be used for agriculture could be one of those foils to that problem really yeah other sources of sustainable fuels like um, heifer and similar that comes from waste oils and and other um, things like cooking oil used cooking oil And some of the challenges with that are the limited availability of of the source uh, material. Um, And that's why they're looking at things like household waste to sustainable fuels, because you need this source of carbon. And obviously household waste has paper and other things in it, which you can potentially convert uh, to these sustainable fuels. Um, But I I think generally the, the challenge with these fuels like biofuels and heifer and and, and waste is it's a limited feedstock whereas with the power to liquids process it's uh, literally taking CO2 out of the air recycling it turning it back into fuel and I I find that quite elegant but it does need a huge amount of uh, cheap energy and that's the key thing. Jasmine do you have anything to say about the sustainability on this topic? Uh, The social sustainability, I think, is an interesting point that Sophie brought up because it's a really good question of who is going to pay because ultimately, because we are a capitalist society, it will be the um, person buying a plane ticket that's going to have to pay. I suppose they created the demand for it, so why why wouldn't they? I don't know, but at the same time, the consumer does have the power to change the industry, so if there is a more bigger demand for more sustainable flights and you could see a growth in that market and then that could lead to more investment within into sustainable fuel technologies which could then bring the market sustainable fuel market to a point where it is comparable in terms of price to conventional fuels and then we can eventually like get to the stage where they basically you don't need fossil fuels in the aviation sector because your alternative fuels there are they're cheaper if not like the same price so i think it's like an interesting perspective and interesting point because it is because ultimately like it, it's going to have to be the um the person buying a plane ticket who's going to have to pay unless there's like some heavy government subsidies or the airlines willing to invest something to subsidize to subsidize like airfares if they want to go sustainable because right now like british airways you, you do have the option of offsetting your emissions using sustainable aviation fuels but it's actually really expensive it pretty much will like it can over double the cost of your air of your airfare yeah and i think that's what i mean about who fundamentally does fit the bill there's two there's two common arguments to it one is that you subsidize it through taxes and the downside of that is that everybody including people that don't fly have to subsidize it yeah. and, and, and pay, which isn't necessarily fair on those people that are perhaps taking trains instead, for example. And the only other option is, yeah, increase ticket prices. But I think in these early days when they're trying to um, spearhead the development and, and help companies get started in the sustainable fuel space, I think we'll see a, a blended approach where some airlines are having to increase their ticket prices and the government is, is subsidizing some of these early stage um, grants. Just to change tact, this is partly fueled because I want to talk about this, which is how sustainable is it if we're talking about carbon neutral? Because we're kind of counting on carbon captured storage, which has its own energy challenges as well. Sustainable in what sense, Antonia? <laughs> Sorry. You know my background, you have to be specific. I mean, because of how much energy is needed to capture carbon, uh, carbon dioxide in carbon capture processes, does that really stack up when you then need to generate a fuel out of it? Yeah, so like it's kind of like a similar issue to hydrogen because when you actually like work out the actual efficiency, it's quite low because you have to put in a lot of energy to then generate a fuel that has actually lo- less megajoules than the megajoules you put in to make it. So like that is an issue that people are addressing, but it's just an issue with any kind of synthetic fuel. Because you're just going to lose some energy somewhere. Sure. 
one thing that I find quite interesting is that we, we've done some material and energy balances for our design of our e-fuels plant, and the vast majority of the energy, about 90% of it, goes into the hydrogen production rather than the carbon capture. So the energy involved with the carbon capture isn't as bad as you might think. Are you guys using a solid sorbent direct air capture? That is a great question, Jasmine, because we're actually uh, looking at a range of technologies but I suppose the one in the short term will be that technology where you're using um, adsorbents uh, and that does mean that there are consumables involved. Um, but something that Sophie and I are really excited about is um, direct ocean capture. Sophie, do you want to talk a bit about direct ocean capture? Sure. So very similar to direct air capture, except the location is different, shall we say. Um, and that is the principle that you would then put a big straw in, in the middle of the ocean and you can suck up your carbon dioxide and extract it from your filtered water. And then that actually becomes your carbon dioxide feedstock. And I suppose the reason why it's a really interesting technology to pursue is because the concentration of carbon dioxide in seawater is 140 times greater than in the air. So if you're talking about efficiencies, if you can get that technology up to a level where it performs at the same or even above direct air capture, you've got a real chance of of being able to capture even more carbon dioxide and therefore that would have a positive impact on the amount of fuel you can make um, and therefore the amount of carbon dioxide you're taking out of the atmosphere. Um, it's a very, very low TRL technology at the moment, I suppose. Um, there are people working on it, very clever people doing very clever things. Uh, but in terms of commercial readiness, it's not quite at the point that um, direct air capture is or other sources. But I would definitely say watch that, watch this space on that one. Um, you are bound by location to some extent, obviously. But then on the flip side, it opens up a whole host of opportunities. Because if you start to go a bit blue sky thinking on it, wouldn't it be cool if we could use direct ocean capture on top of all of those abandoned um, North Sea oil wells, for instance. So you've already got the infrastructure there, you've got your whole source of carbon dioxide, you just need to sort of retrofit a new plant on top of that, and then you've built yourself a new production facility. So the possibilities are really exciting with that. And it's worth pointing out that the ocean is a huge uh, carbon dioxide sink. So I think it's 40% of atmospheric CO2 has been absorbed by the oceans and it kind of stays close to the surface, which is why you get that 140 times concentration. And the nice thing about extracting CO2 from the oceans is that it's an electrochemical process. So you can do it with um, electrochemistry. So you're not needing adsorbents. Um, you might need membranes, which also wear out, etc but it promises potentially greater efficiencies, lower energy requirements, and uh, yeah, it's quite exciting. Yeah, so just to break it down a bit more, so the, the direct air capture is fundamentally using different technologies. Can you explain the, the actual technical steps and how they differ? Sure, so for the direct ocean capture, uh, when carbon dioxide is absorbed by the oceans, it forms carbonates and it becomes uh, sort of bound um, within in the water and it doesn't want to come back out. But if you can temporarily acidify a portion of seawater by lowering its pH, the carbon dioxide will turn back into a gas and you can uh, use a vacuum degasser and it will just boil out. And so what they do is through an electro electrochemical process, um, push uh, hydrogen ions into a portion of water and that CO2 comes out. Um, uh, as for direct air capture, uh, we just discovered that we could buy it. So I know it uses adsorbents, but not being a massive chemistry uh, nerd about direct air capture, maybe someone else might be able to answer that one. Yeah, sure. So I can go over how direct air capture works. So in direct air capture, basically what's happened is you have air that contains CO2 and basically you're just stripping out a large fraction of that CO2. So in direct air capture, there's generally two types. You have your solid sorbent and your liquid solvent. So in the solid sorbent, it's more or less like a metal rectangle where you pump air into it. And in the middle, there's like, you can think of it as a bit of like a membrane type of thing. It's 
not actually a member, but that's the best way I can kind of like try to describe it. And in that membrane, it has different materials um, that, that, but the key material is that you have some chemicals that react with the carbon dioxide in the air that basically will make that carbon dioxide bond to it to form another chemical. And so the air passes through, carbon dioxide gets stripped out because it bonds to the membrane and then like a less CO2 intensive airstream flows, flows out. And so with the carbon dioxide bonded to the chemical, you then heat it and put it under some pressure changes to then make that chemical decompose to release that CO2. And then that CO2 gets sucked out and then you can either use it to make amazing e-fuels or you can also use it for other applications so there are some small plants where you actually use it to enhance greenhouse productivity you can also just inject it into the ground uh, so li- that solid sorbent liquid sorbents are liquid solvents slightly different process uh, so a liquid you it's similar in the first stage where basically you have air that comes into contact with a chemical that will react with the co2 but in the liquid sorbent you have like a liquid stream that's basically removing the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere so in liquid sorbent it's traditionally potassium hydroxide that reacts with the co2 and then that goes through another series of chemical reactions because at the very end you have calcium carbonate which you then need to decompose and that will release the carbon dioxide which basically then just gets separated out into a pure stream and then you can do whatever you want with it so that's generally how direct air capture works so what i'm understanding is there's some similar processes happening where we're bonding carbon dioxide to something preferentially and then finding a way for it to be released whether that's through decomposition or heating up a material is that right yeah yeah generally yeah basically you just need to make carbon dioxide in the in the air react with another chemical to make a new chemical and then you have to do something to that new chemical to make the carbon dioxide be released so that you can capture it. Okay, so I think we understand that. And I think we've talked a lot about the technical, uh, how any fuel is made, um, I think. So CO2 is quite energetically stable. And to turn it back into a fuel, you, you kind of have to smoosh the hydrogen back into the carbon dioxide. And you typically need an intermediate step where you convert the carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. And so you want to pull off one of those oxygens. And a really cool technology that Sophie and I came across is called uh, solid oxide electrolysis. And we need to make hydrogen and an electrolyzer makes hydrogen. But what's really cool about solid oxide electrolyzers is that it works by stripping off oxygen. So if you pass steam, so H2O, and you pass in your carbon dioxide, uh, CO2, out the other side, you end up with CO, your carbon monoxide, and hydrogen gas, which is perfect. That's syn gas. And you can then pass that syn gas into what's called a fischer tross reactor. And that has a catalyst, typically cobalt or iron. And on the surface of that catalyst, it will start growing these long chain hydrocarbons. And typically what comes out the bottom of the fischer tross reactor is like this uh, thick waxy solid. And you then pass that to a hydrocracker and that can convert that waxy solid into the length of hydrocarbon that you need. And you can literally just set the flashpoint and you can decide whether you want kerosene or diesel or whatever fuel you want to make. So for all those billionaires trying to do space travel, we could also make them have sustainable space fuel you absolutely could and one of the things that you also need in a rocket is oxygen and the electrolyzer because it's splitting the water into hydrogen and oxygen you actually have um, the oxygen fuel as well that you need for the rocket Uh, and elon did tweet in 2021 that spacex is actually looking into making uh, their own jet fuel via carbon capture so yeah if we can make sustainable space travel what else could we possibly do like what How could we actually get out of traveling so much? Because ultimately we we could try and make a better fuel or we could try and change our behavior through other technologies. We could teleport everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I quite like VR. uh, And I got an Oculus headset last year and a friend came around and we were playing super hot. 
and uh, it's it's straight out of the okay, comedy okay. playbook. Oh, super hot's amazing. Uh, time slows down if you, the slower you move. So if you don't move, time is halted, which is fantastic. But my friend had never played it before, and she had the headset on, and she was sort of punching the bad guys, and she managed to punch my TV, which now has this. <laughs> <laughs> it was a brand new TV as well. I moved into a, a new flat and, and and got a nice big TV, and it has this tiny little scratch. Which now, whenever I watch TV, it's just got this little pixel of light bursting out of the TV and makes me a bit sad. <laughs> I thought you said you liked VR, not you dislike VR, because it sounds like a negative. It's good in the right hands. He likes VR when people aren't punching his television. <laughs> As with most people. Yeah. Yeah, I think teleportation, it, it would be great if we could do that. Just think about how much time you'd save on travel. Yeah. Or like in the Star Wars movies and the Marvel movies, like holograms, mm. video calling, but like with a hologram. Oh, Neuralink. Oh, Neuralink, yeah. Of course, Elon Musk again. <laughs> 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 Potentially, you could hallucinate that you're actually at the destination because some electrodes have stimulated your brain in the right way. Yeah. Or it could be like in Ready Player One, where it's all like in a virtual world where we all just live. But not quite in the Matrix, because that would be bad if we're in the Matrix. Can I just say, uh, Sophie and I don't want this feature because it's going to reduce demand for a fuel. <laughs> <laughs> Travel, see people, it's, uh, it's better for your health. <laughs> or is it just an intermediate, you know, until, until the VR technology is so good that it doesn't feel like we aren't there and we actually do just live in the Matrix, but we don't know. What about if it goes the other way? You've got so much tech going on and so many exciting things. Maybe there's a whole portion of society that just goes, nope, not interested, I'll just walk. That's my form of travel. And we just go completely <laughs> the other way. So, and again, that doesn't do us any favours either. So, <laughs> happy middle ground, <laughs> please. I, I think there is this sort of fantastic situation we can get to through innovation and technology where things like flying can become sustainable and one of the things that i love about power to liquid e-fuels is we're kind of advancing carbon capture technology and whilst we're using that carbon to make fuel potentially we could sequester some percentage of it into the ground and then if you took a flight it would actually be carbon negative because we would be sequestering some carbon and that could go some way to actually undoing uh, this accumulation of co2 in the atmosphere how do you sequester f some of the CO2 if you're using that to generate your fuel? You would simply pipe 20% of it under the ground or some percentage. Uh, I mean, you'd probably be having to do that out of the kindness of your heart or because your customers are paying you to. But I, see. I, I think it's something Sophie and I would like to do because we're, we're socially responsible. Isn't syngas a great chemical building block for other materials? So other than fuels, as a hydrocarbon, we could go into polymer making. Is that possible from uh, from your process? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, should be. I guess with this, the, t the options are really just limited by how creative you'd like to get. There are so many opportunities to lock carbon in different ways and use it in creative and different and responsible manners. It's, it really is just up to innovation. And that's why it's great to be a, a startup in an industry that is very dominated by large enterprises because it gives you that creativity and that opportunity to, to champion other ideas. So absolutely it's possible. Yeah, you can make uh, almost anything. And, and we have seen companies in this space making uh, carbon captured alcohols, for example, and perfumes. And we've also uh, talked about, Sophie and I, um, because you effectively have a distillation column and, and anything that's currently made with uh, fossil fuels like plastics, etc., could be made through this process. So potentially you could make trainers, you could make clothes, um, the, the sky's the limit. But you do have to then think about the sustainability of plastics because they, they don't have a good track record of being recycled and seem to have a tendency to end up in the oceans, unfortunately. But there's presumably other chemicals that you can make that do biodegrade. And um, methanol as a fuel, for example, is fantastic because it does biodegrade in, in nature. So how does carbon neutral fuels, your company, fit into to all of this picture? Sure. So we kind of have two paths ahead of us. One is to become a technology company where we integrate these different pieces of the puzzle into a complete system. And I think we're leaning towards this uh, end goal. Uh, and 
Ultimately, we'd like to make these kind of shipping container sized modules that can be easily transported, easily mass manufactured, that enable our customers to make fuel. And what we quite like about that is it's very scalable. And if, if we're going to solve climate change, this needs to be scalable. And the aviation fuel um, challenge isn't unique to the UK. It's a, it's a global problem. So if we can sell technology globally you, and even license IP globally, that's very quick. Whereas the, the other path afforded to us is to become a fuel supplier and to use this fuel, uh, use this technology to make fuel and sell that fuel direct to customers. Um, that has its challenges uh, in the UK, as we mentioned, with the cost of electricity. So I think we're, we're leaning towards the uh, approach of, of being a technology company. What's next? Where do you take that idea? I suppose it's just about, in a way, taking one step at a time and the industry is so um, newly formed that I guess it can go anywhere. And we're currently just working out where we fit into that. Um, in the short term, we're currently raising some money to help grow our team and to help set our strategy in motion and actually do the design drawings that would enable us to then go on to construct and build the e facility and then within that you have a whole host of actions like talking to airlines talking to airports working out where you're going to put your facility so it's sort of everything in a way we're sort of <laughs> doing everything um and then ultimately we would love in the next couple of years to have a facility a, a demonstration site that um is outputting aviation fuel and before 2030 wouldn't it be great if we were flying on our fuel so I suppose that's the aim wonderful so I think we've flown all over the place with this episode we've <laughs> nice. started off by discussing a method for making e-fuels from water electrolysis and make use of captured carbon dioxide and this is great because it offers the practicalities of existing technologies and that can help accelerate the transition to sustainable fuels and reduce environmental impacts the views expressed in this podcast belong entirely to the person that said them. They do not represent any industry or organisation. If you enjoyed listening to these views, it would really help us out if you could rate us, leave a review and tell a friend. This podcast was sponsored by no one, but if you're interested in funding us to continue to have frank discussions about science and engineering, please get in touch.